Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's enterprise skill session from the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group at RGU. Thank you for joining us for this quick lunch and learn session. Today, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Graham Carter, who is Intellectual Property and Spinout Development Manager at RGU. And the topic of discussion today is all about protecting your intellectual property. So Graham's going to take you through some of the different mechanisms and rights that you have for protecting both the intellectual property you're creating and the looking after the intellectual property you are bringing in. So as always, please keep yourselves on mute unless you have a question. You can use the chat to ask any questions as you're going through. The session is recorded, so if you do choose to unmute at any time, please note that your voice recording will be in uh, the sessions and the slides will be sent out afterwards as we go through. So without any further ado, I'm happy to pass you over to Graham, who's going to be leading today's session. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Edward. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me get my slide deck up and we can start talking about intellectual property straight away. Hang on. Work the technology here. There's always a slight frisson of, uh, of fear for me. Will the machine hold up? Here we go. So you should be seeing a, a PowerPoint. Intellectual property opening slide. Thumbs up, anyone else? Yes, good, 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 good. All right, then we'll, uh, as I say, well, welcome everybody. Um, the session objectives, as, as I see them for today, is, is really to give you a, a real sort of entry level introduction to the language of intellectual property. I kind of want to cement in your minds the difference between intellectual property and intellectual property rights. Uh, I know that these, these two concepts do get conflated, and, and rightly so. I mean, they are related, of course. Um, but, but I just wanted to draw out that distinction as we go through. And, and really, you know, what I can hope to achieve is, is to give you a very basic understanding of the different types of intellectual property. And I'll even caveat that a little bit more about four particular types of intellectual property right. Okay. So, um, those of you who know me, and I, and I recognize some of the names who are in the room here, those of you who know me know that I go for a, I quite like a visual metaphor. And, and before we actually start talking about intellectual property rights, I always feel it's worth stepping back and reflecting on why we have them. Why do we have the laws of intellectual property? Why do we have the laws of copyright? Why do we have patent laws? And for me, it's about creativity. It's about apportioning what is yours versus what is someone else's creative output. It's about shredding this line between what is inspired by something you've learned or developed somewhere versus what is you're ripping off from someone else. And there's a very ugly and strong word, plagiarism. So at the end of the day, for me, intellectual property laws, intellectual property rights exist to draw that boundary, to find that balance between this, this, this concept of inspiration versus plagiarism and, and to sort of extend the, the metaphor further you know what we're trying to do with intellectual property laws is is to see, perhaps consider what the boundary is between your work and somebody else's work or as i framed it here does your innovation encroach on anybody else's innovation and uh, ultimately when the proverbial hits the fan, you may have to go to court to, to, to establish what is yours versus what is somebody else's. And it's likely that you'll be in some sort of infringement case. Okay. So, you know, an example of that would be this, this, this image here. I, I use this regularly in, in my presentations around intellectual property and, and pose the question, you know, does, do we think the pop art infringes the copyright of the photographic portrait here? And this was a real live case uh, in relatively recent times. In 2019, it was heard in New York. And if you think that it, 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 it does infringe, or if you think that it doesn't infringe, the sort of deliberations that went on in that courtroom, it's quite interesting to, to read because the first verdict that came out in 2019 was that this was non-infringing. You know, and, and they looked at the, the creative process of the photographer they looked at the creative process of the pop artist, was Warhol in this instance. They looked at the output of their, their creative thoughts and, and the decisions that they made in their creative uh, endeavors. And they decided that the aesthetic of the pop art is wholly distinctive 
and creates a completely different look and feel from the photograph. And therefore in 2019, it was non-infringing. So we can see then that the pop art was inspired by the photograph. But when you're a real live judge and you're, and you're, you're actually deliberating upon uh, infringement cases, there's other factors that you need to take into account as well. And of course, lo and behold, um, two years later, there was an appeal and the, the decision was reversed. And the decision was reversed because there was the deliberation or the discovery that you know, did Warhol have the right to have access to that image? And it was an unpublished photograph. Did he have the right permissions in place to take that image and, and, and be inspired by it? And the deliberation was that he didn't. And therefore the copyright infringement was upheld. So that gives you a, a, a kind of flavor, if you like, of both ends of, 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 of the intellectual property laws and, and actually the difficulty in some instances of, of how you might deliberate and ultimately decide upon whether something is infringing or not. It's not just a great, just, just to look at the images in copyright instances, if it is, a, if it is a, a, an image that's a deliberation, it's the background factors as well that will be weighed in. So my, my central thesis and my idea always is to enable the fair transaction of creativity. It's worth reflecting on that and remembering that. Um, and when we talk about intellectual property, we're talking about creativity. And when we're talking about intellectual property rights, we're talking about a number of legal frameworks, things like patents, things, things like trademark law, things like design rights, things like the copyright laws. These are the laws, the particular frameworks that map to particular creative outputs. Okay, so here we are, I've got the big four here. The type of intellectual property right would be the patent, the design right, the trademark or the copyright and the creative output that they map to, patents speak to inventions. You know, patents are, are capturing a particular output of creativity, of, of creative thought, of design, of engineering skill, of technological skill, because they deal with inventions. Um, as an intellectual property right, they must be applied for. They are a so-called registered right. They're not something that happens automatically. You have to make a an active decision and indeed put your hand in your pocket to get a patent in place. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about the nature of patent as we go through. Designs or, or design rights, these are similar to patents in that they can be, you can apply for them. Uh, and certainly from a commercial perspective, it gives you a, a whole lot more power in the marketplace if you have registered your design. But designs are about the aesthetic, they're about uh, look of an object that you might have created. Um, they're nothing to do with say structural features. So they kind of the, the look and the shape of a product. Uh, they'll deal with um, uh, wallpapers and, 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 and uh, commonly design rights are used in the, in, the, in the fashion industry and so forth. But, but other, other sectors as well, they're, they're very important and quite powerful uh, commercial rights as well as I'll allude to again as we go through. Um, trademarks. So I think probably most of us in the room will have some sort of sense of, as to what a trademark is. It, it, it's at its base, it's a brand signifier. So we're very much uh, stepping in the territory of, of, of how different companies and products are differentiated from each other in the marketplace. And again, like um, design rights, they can be registered or unregistered. I'll unpack what that means as we go through. And then the final big one, if you like, uh, in terms of intellectual property right is, is the laws of copyright. And this is a hugely wide ranging um, um, basket, if you like, of, of creative works that fall under the copyright laws, um, distinctive from all of the other rights that I've alluded to in that the, these are automatic rights. So the, uh, copyright accrues to the author at the point at which they've committed their thoughts to paper. You know, if, if, if you're a coder and you, you've written that software code, that software code is the copyright material. That idea that you've rendered into, into the world in some way, you've captured into the world in some way is the copyright material. Okay, so if you're a poet, if you're an author, 
it, it's it's the it, it's the formation of words on the page that is the copyright material. Um, at the bottom of this slide, I've also alluded to trade secrets and know-how. These are strictly speaking not intellectual property rights, but they are certainly and, and would be bracketed together with what we're actually talking about here. And, and what we're actually talking about here are intangible assets. Now, all, all of these things collectively would be assets in a business, assets to a, 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 a professional, uh, someone, someone's, someone's professional practice, assets to an artist or, or, or whatever. Um, and certainly the things like trade secrets and know-how can be transacted through licensing, can be uh, sold, through business acquisitions and so forth. So they're commonly lumped together with, with intellectual property. They're more governed by procedure and duties of contract. You know, say for example, contracts of employment. Uh, through my contract of employment, I have transferred my copyright to the university simply by, by, by being an employee. So, so my know-how, accrues to me but my work output belongs to the university because they pay me to do this stuff so that, that, that's an example of, of of how intellectual property can get accumulated within an organization by contracts okay and again in this sort of preamble before we do a bit of a, a dive into those different types of right it's worth reflecting uh on what property rights are uh, people, in my experience, commonly uh, get a little flustered about intellectual property and find, find the intangibleness a bit difficult. Um, but actually, if you ask them the question, what is property? Never mind what is intellectual property. Um, it sounds, can sometimes sort of cause a bit of a jolt. And actually, what is property? You know, um, Ultimately, it, it's an abstract. It's a construct. It, it's not something that is tangible. Um, it's, a, it's a legal right. Okay, and, and, and what is property? The rights of ownership are in threefold. I've tried to sort of bullet them here. Um, the rights of ownership gives you the right to sell whatever it is you, you, you purport to own. You can give it away, you can destroy it. Doesn't necessarily give you the right to use it, of course, but um, ownership gives you the right to transact it. Um, and the kind of opposite of that is ownership rights give you the right to exclude others from using your property and equally therefore ownership rights give you the right to permit others to use your property you can give license to other people to use your property and these, these basic kind of property definitions and thoughts about property absolutely map to intellectual property as well just with intellectual property what we're dealing with is something perhaps more intangible than an actual physical object so um, this is an example I, I always put up and, and, and I'm picking on Instagram, but it could be any of the social medias in, in many respects. You know, when you upload that um, image of your um, crushed avocado on toast to, to Instagram, um, you maintain the ownership of that image. You are the copyright holder of that image. You're not transferring any ownership to them, but what you are doing is you're granting them license to use that image. You're giving them exploitation rights to that image. You know, and you do that by you ticking of their, their, their end user license agreement. You're ticking their, their, their terms of reference, terms of use, sorry. Um, and in the language of intellectual property, this is a sort of, this is a sort of statement that, that the, the, these brand owners hold. You know, what you're doing there is you're giving them a, essentially the ability to do whatever it is with your content anywhere in the world without having to pay you without having to reference you at all um, but you maintain the ownership of it okay so exploitation rights are transferable on a permission basis and that's what you're doing when you sign up to instagram or facebook or any of these other things you own that image but you're giving them permission to do that and, and that's not a problem we live with that and that's that's how the, the world works within these systems. And this is a note to myself really to, to remind me to, to point out to you that we're talking about laws here. So laws are what makes countries different from each other, that they're territorial, they're sovereign. So whilst I'm talking in generality about intellectual property rights, 
and by and large the principles of intellectual property rights translate right across the shall we say the developed world and, and certainly the, the world of commercial commerce there are various treaty instruments that synchronize um, different countries together around uh, frameworks in law not just intellectual property laws trade tariffs and all that good stuff as well um, but in detail you know the laws of copyright in the US are going to be the law different from the laws of copyright in Germany and in turn in different from the laws of copyright in in South Africa for example so the procedures that you might follow for example if you're filing a patent in the US would be different from the procedures you might follow if you're filing a patent in in a European territory so bear that in mind. Um, and one of the things that I, I like to present, and, and certainly this is true of the commercial world, is this concept of the intellectual property escalator. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth reflecting that as your, your asset, as your product gets nearer to reality and becomes more tangible, that invention gets developed and, and actually becomes a product, um, you will probably be looking to patent it ultimately if it is an inventive invention um, and that the, the, the cost that you incur in doing that is, is greater than the start point for that invention and that was your your marshalling of your know-how and the gathering of confidential information and then maybe some trade secrets and, and so forth that you had that, that went into designing that that product to start with but this slide also speaks to the other truth in, in certainly the way that people manage their intellectual property assets in that what companies are commonly trying to do is build a moat. This is a phrase that I've heard people, people use. They try and build a moat around their, their product space. They try and differentiate themselves in the marketplace by using all of the different types of intellectual property right that are available to them. Um, so people try and get onto this, this intellectual property escalator as they as they can afford to and, and, and as their product requires it and as they get known and, and, and they start to get traction in the marketplace. So, you know, this, this should, shouldn't be news to you, but you, you can imagine that one product and I'm picking on a, on what looks like an iPhone here, you know, your average kind of smartphone, one product will have around it a whole ecosystem of different intellectual property rights. And certainly all, all, all the big players in the marketplace, Apple in particular, Apple, if, if, if it's nothing else, is a design house. You know, you open the Apple box, what does it say on it? It says, designed in California, made in China. You know, and, and Apple are, are and any, any kind of product area where there's a huge amount of com com competition, you can be sure that the companies with those products will be making use of the intellectual property rights uh, fully. So uh, a typical smartphone will have all sorts of copyrights in it, never mind the material that you add into it. Um, it will have design rights in it, design patents, as they're called in the United States, capturing the aesthetic, the look and the shape and the feel of the phone. It will have all sorts of patents in there as well that underpin the basic kind of architecture of the of, of subsystems, the sort of technology that went into it. So fingerprint sensors, touchscreen technology, some of the radio, uh, um, radio transmission protocols and so forth and, and systems that, that sort of make it function as an object um, will be protected by patent and of course it'll have trademarks as well you know and, and I, I propose a, a thought experiment for you if your iPhone didn't have that Apple logo on the back would it even be an iPhone okay so let's start talking a little bit about these intellectual property rights. And I'll start with patents. These are the, what people most think about, I think, when, when, when they hear the phrase intellectual property. I hope that I'm convincing you that patents are not the only show in town when it comes to intellectual property. It's far from the truth. But they are an important part of, of intellectual property and, and they're kind of top stair on that um, IPR escalator, as I've tried to uh, outline it. And what you're doing when you're seeking to get patent registration for your invention is that you'll be writing a, essentially an essay. You'll be, you'll be starting with a blank piece of paper and you'll be telling uh, the world about your invention. And you'll be making the case in that essay, in that patent application, for why your invention is new, 
because what you'll be doing in there is you'll be describing what the existing landscape is like for, for, for this the, the technological invention that you're, you're in. So you'll be describing what is called the prior art and you'll be setting out why your invention is new and why it is distinctive from that prior art. Um, you will be setting out therefore that your invention has undergone some sort of inventive step and it's not obvious from the prior art. And because it's an invention, you will be making the case that, that it is capable of, of industrial applications. You will, you will outline where it can be used and what uses it can be put to. Because what you're trying to do in your patent application is you're trying to convince someone called an examiner to give you this, this patent right. And we'll talk about what the patent right is, but you have to overcome the examiner and the examiner will be looking at your patent application from three perspectives, if you like. He or she will be absolutely checking to see whether your invention is new. They will look at the prior art. They will do all sorts of searches from all sorts of databases from all, all over the world. And they will, they will find any publications that might hint at uh, your invention not being new. So they will, they will do that. That is something that they can objectively do. Um, they will also read it very much through the, through the lens of whether or not the, an inventive step has occurred. And, and the easiest thing is, as well to, to test is, is, is whether, you, whether it is an invention. So this is, you wouldn't be filing a patent on a piece of sculptural art. Uh, you wouldn't be filing, filing a patent on um, some new law in nature that you have discovered. Uh, it has to be an invention that you're filing a patent on. And if the examiner is satisfied that you, you've, you've satisfied all these, these patentability tests, they will give you a patent right. You know, actually, I've gone ahead of myself a little bit with, with, with my presentation here, but this slide here that I'm putting up it, it is to try and suggest to you why we have patents and what, what is actually going on when we, when we file a patent. What you're doing when you file a patent is you're putting your patent into the public domain. You're actually revealing, you're laying open um, the nature of your invention. But in return for putting that in the public domain, you are going to get a period of exclusivity in the marketplace, a monopoly right, through which you can then exploit that invention um, and, and, and get a return on, your, a return on that investment. And the reason society encourages this system and wants this system to occur is that, believe it or not, it stimulates economic activity. It stimulates your competitors to find a workaround for your patent it might stimulate your competitors to license your patent as well. So it stimulates economic activity. That, that's the, the rationale for patents in, in, in the developed world. So you're cutting a deal. You're telling the public what your invention is. The public are giving you a period of, of, of monopolist, monopoly to exploit that. And they're giving you 20 years worth of monopoly, right? Um, it doesn't have to be you who exploits it. You could license, you could give permission to other people to go and, 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 and um, develop your, your invention, okay? Um, but that monopoly right, because it's so powerful, um, is uh, in all territories uh, um, surrounded by um, quite strong and punitive fines if, if you're found to be infringing anybody else's IP, uh, patent particularly, sorry. Um, and it's worth, stating what the act of infringement is in the patent context and that is selling or using a patented device making using or selling a patented device in the territory without permission of the patent holder so again remember this is territorial if if your competitors are selling your invention in the united states and you don't have a patent in the united states that's that's tough luck you know um and of course the reverse is true so generally, when you're looking for patents, you'll be going to put them into the places where you've got a market and where you can afford to do it, of course, because the cost of filing patents is expensive and um, you should assume that it's going to cost you many thousands of pounds just to establish a patent in the UK, never mind starting to internationalise it. And when I worked in industry, I used to manage a patent portfolio of around 40 odd patents. We would be spending something like a quarter of a million euros just moving those through the system. 
and big fat message at the bottom you wouldn't consider filing a patent without getting professional guidance you'd be just wasting your effort and your money unless you really knew what you were doing let's go through that let's just change gear a little bit and speak about trademarks um i think most of us have a kind of notion understanding of what a trademark is uh, it, it, it's a it's a sign which distinguishes one service or product uh, from a particular trader from, from another person's uh, service or product. Um, the sign can be in many different types, and I'll outline what those are in a moment. Um, the trademark owner, if, if you've got a trademark owner, you can stop, you can go after someone who appears to be encroaching on your bubble, um, it appears to be looking to pass off their product as yours. You know, there's, a, there's a great example here of that on, on this slide here. The, the puffins from Asda uh, were, were very much stepping on allied biscuits toes uh, with, with their penguin product. And indeed, um, the puffins have gone instinct in that um, because of a, uh, of a lawsuit that the allied biscuits took up against um, um, Asda at that time. Um, as with any other property, Trademarks can be bought and sold and licensed. Um, they're actually a very powerful and very cost-effective intellectual property, right? Um, generally speaking, in the UK, they last for 10 years, and they can be renewed. So they can effectively be perpetual as long as you're doing the renewal fee. Yeah, you know, the thing about trademarks is, you know, alluded to Allied Biscuits there and, and as the, the supermarkets and uh, uh, well, of a, well into um a kind of arms race around their their branding and you know calling the caterpillar despite what you might have read in the news as being a copyright dispute was actually a trademark dispute you know marks and spencers have actually got some 13 trademarks registered around colin the caterpillar and when i looked this up i hadn't i've only just sort of realized that colin has a partner called connie who appears also to be a, a caterpillar because marks and spencers have a, a trademark around the phrase colin and connie the caterpillars so that's something for your pub quiz knowledge. Trademarks are not just words. You, you, you can get trademarks that are so-called word or device marks. And you've got the BMW logo as an exemplar there. You can have trademarks around a sound. Uh, a few notes, a few bars for, of music can be trademark. You can have a so-called device mark. You know, the, the Apple logo is, is an example of a device mark. Excuse me, I've got a dog in the background uh, kicking off. That's been the postman is delivering. <coughs> Apologies, everyone. Um, the other type of uh, trademark that is, is not unusual is, is a so-called 3D mark, where the actual shape of the packaging of the product uh, assumes a distinctiveness that sets it out from its competitors. You know, the, the Nivea bottle is an example here, but you know, the classic one would be the Coke bottle, of course. And you can trademark particular colors. The yellow here, I think it's from the German post office. Um, you can think of others, I'm sure. The orange from EasyJet would be the one that springs to my mind. Um, but, but brands and brand owners will use all or mix and match many of these categories of trademark to assert their brand, to assert their proprietorialness over their product space. A little sort of procedural thing, you don't actually have to register a trademark to start asserting your proprietorial position over your product. So when Fraser Doherty launched his Super Jam brand and Super Jam product in Waitrose in 2007, he didn't have the cash to go out and register his trademarks. It wasn't until later when, when he started to internationalize it uh, that he went on and registered the trademark and therefore could use that R superscript on his product. And if, if any of you are considering trademarking and so forth, the, the, the uh, website is given there. It's a very useful search tool, actually. Um, you can look at different types of, of uh, trademark for the UK. Um, and uh, get a good understanding of whether or not you might potentially start to infringe other, another person's trademark if you're if you're looking to register something. And just to sort of complete the story on trademarks, when you register a trademark, as Fraser Doherty did here, 
you are confronted and are required to map your service or product to a particular category or particular class as it's called there's a doherty it was a fruit jam product so it was class 29 fruit jams and fruit spreads and this means that the same word can coexist in the trademark register if it doesn't um, overlap with or doesn't encroach significantly upon the same class registrations so super, you know, if, you, if you look for the word super jam in the trademark registers, you'll find that it coexists from different companies using different product spaces. We all know, we, we can all think of silliness around trademarks and branding. You know, brand owners, you know, the big boys are, if, 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 if nothing else, they will be aggressive and sometimes overly aggressive about protecting their brands and get into trouble for doing that. Uh, with some silly ones I've just picked on on Brewdog here, but who, who went after a a pub who, who thought about using the punk in his name. Um, brand owners will go to all sorts of lengths to protect their brand. Ultimately, a brand is the only thing that they have. They, you know, a brand owner has kind of transcended its product space in many respects and spend their days protecting their intellectual property rights, particularly their trademarks. A few words about designs, design rights. Um, what are designs? Well, designs relate to the aesthetic, the overall sort of appearance of a product. So they're the external visible shapes, lines and contours that, that, that comprise a product. Um, typically in the fashion industry, they use quite a lot. It could be wallpaper, it could be designs on kind of greetings cards, any, anything. It can be um, user interfaces. You know, as I mentioned, Apple here, you can recognize two of their they are key pieces of iconography here. These are registered designs. Um, the shape of a whole product could be a registered design if it's not some sort of structural feature. Um, if you are going to register it, you have to, um, the designs that can be accepted have to have some sort of novelty to them. So you can't just copy someone else's design. Um, designs may last for up to 25 years. Um, I think in the UK, you register your design, you have to renew it every five years. Um, there are differences in different territories. It can be quite a powerful commercial right, but it can get expensive because, you know, if you are putting products out there, you generally would be uh, advised and common practice would make it that you would not just protect the whole product, that's so-called whole protection, but you may also go to seek partial protection, as it's called in the, in the language. You might, as the example shows here from, I think this is a, a Nike shoe, um, Nike would have registered designs, multiple designs around that kind of product space. And, and that makes it slightly higher barrier for, for counterfeiters and, and, and so forth to, to get over. We're going to come now on to copyrights, the laws of copyright. Um, first thing I always say is copyright is not the same as copywriting. Copywriting is, a, is a, a jargon term that's used in the advertising industry for writing copy, for writing content, uh, writing blurb. Uh, the laws of copyright uh, are the laws of copyright. Um, as I alluded to at the beginning, copyright is an automatic right. There's no official register in the UK. There are no forms or fees. Your copyright accrues to you the minute you, as I say, you, you render that, that idea, that thought that you had, that creative thought that you had into something, into the world. Well, that record and you record that song or you write that music down you write that novel that copyright is, is yours um it covers a huge range of creative output and I'll, i've got a list of, of, of the sorts of outputs that it that it speaks to on the next slide the typical rule of thumb is, is to assume that the copyright lasts for 70 years after the author's death um again i've got in the next slide i'll, I'll speak to some of the exceptions there it's always worth, I think, making the point about copyright. You, you, you hear phrases like copyleft. You might hear phrases like creative commons. You might hear phrases like open source. Uh, these things kind of meld together to some extent. I mean, they are subtly different, but, but, but these are forms of copyright. You know, so copyright and creative commons is still a, a form of licensing. It still pertains to copyright output particularly common in, in, in this world of software, open source software and so forth, but make no mistake, it is still a licensing system. And 
certainly this is a message that, that I always try and put out to some of our teams in the academic um, world where we might be commercializing some IP assets that are based on software, for example, you can run into difficulty if you're using open source coding. Um, some of those open source copyleft um, uh, licenses actually prohibit you from, from making commercial use of their code. So you, you need to re re reconfigure it. And this is this slide, oh, goodness me, I'm not going to uh, It's to remind me to sort of uh, indicate to you the wide range of, of outputs that fall under copyright. So, you know, we're talking about music, um, not just the drafting of music, but the recording of music, the broadcasting of music. We're talking about films. We're talking about artistic, musical, dramatic, and literary works. Uh, and, you know, as this slide indicates, the, the duration for which the copyright lasts depends somewhat on the nature of the copyright material. So you can get into all sorts of uh, curious situations so that, you know, things like the crown copyright lasts for 125 years from the end of the calendar year in which the world was first made. So all those COVID signs, the copyright on them, you know, last for a rather a long time. And um, I'm not going to say dwell on this, it's just as I say, to anchor into your mind the sorts of output that, that copyright falls under. Um, I said at the head there that copyright is an automatic right. That doesn't mean that there aren't copyright registration services. Um, these are more uh, in, in the UK. These are a, a place where an author or a copyright creator pays to register their material in a repository and get a kind of date stamp. And I, and I think of this as a sort of insurance policy against at some point in the future, if, if there is some um, infringement brought against the author, they can pull out of their back pocket evidence that they created this work way back in the 1980s uh, or whenever it was. But that's all it is. It, it's just a date stamp. Um, it's not an obligation on you. It doesn't impact on your, your rights under the laws of copyright. In the United States, you do need to register your copyright. There is a copyright registry um, and you certainly wouldn't be able to go to law uh, and litigate against the Andy Warhol Foundation unless you have your photograph registered at the Copyright Registration Service in, in, in the United States. Um, just because it's an automatic right, it doesn't mean to say that you can just uh, assert your copyright. And certainly in the, in the commercial world, I would always suggest to people the minimum you should do is to use the C copyright thing the date in which you first produced the material and who it belongs to. Um, so really, if I was to follow my own advice, this little C copyright notice should be at the bottom of all of these slides. Um, there are other notices and, and, and ways of asserting your copyright. And you know, there's, there's some examples here. I'm sure you've all seen them in, in various sort of outputs that you consumed. Um, Legally speaking, they don't have a whole lot of uh, use. They're kind of equivalent to a keep off the grass sign. I think people have, have read that, that, that statement. The assertion of copyright is, is not strictly necessary in the UK. In some territories, it absolutely is. So as I say, I, I always recommend people get into the, into the habit and, and certainly if you're putting stuff into the public domain to make sure at least you've got the year at which you created the material and who you believe uh, um, that that copyright material belongs to, that, that C notice at the bottom. So I'm just, just going to finish up here now with, with uh, some myth busting. Um, I've got, I think, four, maybe five, I should know, shouldn't I? Uh, four, I think five myths that I just want to run through with you concerning copyright. So th these aren't the only myths that are out there um, and they're not in any particular order. Um, but let's do it anyway. Uh, myth number one, you can use copyright work without permission as long as you are not making money from it. And, and that is a myth, you know, you, whether you're making money or not is, is, is totally irrelevant in UK terms. Um, unless you are making use of the material under what's called a copyright exception, and I will tell you what those are in a moment, um, you do need permission to use other people's copyright work. And well, here's, here's a silly example. 
good things in the marketplace. One of the silly things they've done was to use music in their online classes without having a license in place. Uh, so the music publishers are going after them, as are a lot of other people, uh, for, for some of that, say, the, the basic kind of copyright infringement um, there. Um, copyright myth number two, you can use copyright work as long as you credit the author. Um, well, no, I mean, it is certainly good practice to cite where you got your material from. Absolutely it is. Um, but that doesn't necessarily avoid you from, from um, um, infringing their rights. You know, it, it is about permission. Um, myth number three, you always need permission to use copyright work. Well, huh, actually, there are these fair dealing exceptions. Maybe the copyright work is under one of these Creative Commons licenses. Okay, you don't need to, to use permission because it's come with a kind of prepack permission in it. Um, or it's off copyright. Uh, so you, you do need to do a bit of due diligence or you're using it for one of these exceptions. So it's referred to as fair dealing or, or uh, non-infringing activity. Um, so commonly, and this is the UK context, now, if you're using material for private study and research purposes, that's fine. You don't need necessarily a license or permission from the copyright holder. Copies or lending for educational purposes. There, there are, you know, libraries exist. We were able to hold multiple copies and give them out. Um, this is this baked in licenses to the way that the library system works. For educational purposes, you don't need um, to get permission. Uh, criticism and news reporting, uh, incidental inclusion, caricature, parody and prestige. These, these are all exceptions which, if you think about it, cut to our freedom of speech and, and the open society that we, we you know, we're, we're realising it's a bit of a luxury, perhaps, in recent days. Um, criticism and news reporting, incident and inclusion, character and prestige. These are very, very important. And I say um, foundations of, of an open society, actually. So you can make use of, of, of other people's copyright for those purposes. And the other technical thing is, is what's doing or making backups of, of other people's work. If you've licensed it somewhere, you can, it can hold multiple copies if you've got it on different formats so that you don't lose it uh, if it's for your own personal use. So if you did find yourself in a, in a copyright infringement case and you could prove that you were doing any of those things, you might be able to get away with it. Uh, I've lost track of where we are in numbers now, but a copyright myth here is changing or editing somebody else's work enables you to use it without infringing copyright. Well, that's unless you've got one of those copyright exemptions, um, you know, the whole music sampling thing as it came about, um, you do need permission, you know, you do need license from the, from the copyright holder um, to change someone else's work and reuse it, repack it. Um, and the final myth, this is the final one on the list, I think, um, there is a specific amount of work that you can borrow without infringing their copyright. And I certainly used to think that, oh, you can photocopy it's up to 10% of a book and that you're not going to be treading on anyone's toes. That is a myth. Um, in the UK, the courts define substantial part, they use the word substantial to mean its qualitative impact to the work. So, you know, it is, it is determined on a case by case basis, but you know, infringement could be just a six second sample of a piece of music, or it could be a, you know, copying a whole speech or something like that. Um, it, it, it's case by case and it's on the quality rather than the amount. So that is a myth. So I'm pretty much drawn to an end here. Um, the key messages that I wanted to get across to you is that intellectual property and any associated intellectual property rights that, that link, link to that intellectual property that you've created as, as, as your creative output um, are intangible assets. They're intangible assets to you, your business, your professional practice. Um, so treat them as such and look after them. Um, I hope I've made the case that the intellectual property laws are there to draw the boundary ultimately between your creative output and the output of others. Um, and I hope I've, I've made the case that you recognise that if you want to make use of the work of other people, in whatever form that might be, you, commonly that you might need to seek permission. Um, a bit of a shout out for our team here and what the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group do. 
certainly in the RGU context, um, we are one of the key entry points for research commercialization within RGU. So if you've got any thoughts about commercializing your IP or research, come and speak to us. Uh, and I would urge you to do that. Um, come and speak to us early, speak to us often, use us as a sounding board for, for your thoughts about wanting to take something forward into the commercial world. Um, remembering that the IP that you create uh, as part of your research life in the university um, may or may not belong to you. We, we need to find that out. It may or may not lean on other people's IPR within the university, so we need to find that out. A bit of dis discovery would need to take place. There's a whole process for that. Um, but come speak to us. Take care of your IP. It is an asset. Uh, and the final shout out is look out for the other events that the EIG put on. Um, this is just one of a series of skills sessions that we speak about in, in terms of um, supporting this whole um, um, entrepreneurial thinking. Um, I know these slides will go out to all the participants on the call today. Just to make you aware, there are some sources of information that I'm pointing you towards here. Um, I am a fan of the UK government website, surprisingly perhaps, um, that pertains to intellectual property. It has got good quality information about intellectual property in the UK context. If you just Google it, you're likely to come up with US type information or information that, that's maybe muddled. Go to the horse's mouth. They've got good sources of information in there. If you really want to drill down into their site, you can get a, a user account. They've got all sorts of case study stuff. They've got videos, they've got cartoons, they've got uh, checklists and, 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 and if you like, um, quizzes that you can go through to, to, to sort of help embed your, your understanding or any questions you might have about a particular intellectual property right or case. So, so for completeness, this information will be going out to you. And I'll leave you with that, that final slide again. The shout out for the EIG. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Graham. I appreciate you taking the time. If anyone has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. And as Graham was saying, just a reminder that other skill sessions coming up this month, next week at the same time on Wednesday, we have a session on demystifying blockchain. What on earth is it? What's an NFT? Why should you care? And um, so you can join that next Wednesday. And then I think on the 23rd, later on in the month, we have how to conduct business sales. So if you're interested in selling products and service, then that's the next workshop coming up. And the other thing we also have is masterclasses. And this month we have Morgan Walker, who is design director from Lego, coming in to talk about how to innovate uh, and get some top tips from one of the world's biggest companies and brands. So if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join today. Thank you to Graham um, for joining this session and obviously leading it. If you have any questions, then uh, we'll be able to get you in touch and we'll share the slides as we go through and have a fantastic rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.